controls in international locations. Today, I want to consider some of the issues around internal controls outside the United States and why your company's internal controls might require changes for different countries across the globe. However, this provides an opportunity for you to further operationalize your compliance program through internal controls more narrowly tailored to mirror your business practices and the reality on the ground outside of the United States. Every chief compliance officer should consider entity-wide internal controls for a company. Under FCPA accounting provisions, insurers can be liable for the conduct of their foreign subsidiaries, even though improper conduct occurred outside the U.S. The scope of liability is based upon the insurer's incorporation of the subsidiary's financial statements in its own records and SEC filings. So, as with the use of third-party distributors to sell products, FCPA enforcement looks past the structure of the transaction and makes enforcement decisions based upon the substance. While a chief compliance officer should expect or at least hope that internal controls outside the U.S. are of the same effectiveness as internal controls within U.S. business units and at the U.S. corporate office, unfortunately, that may not always be the case. It is often the case that corporate-level internal controls are stronger than those in foreign business units. There may well be several reasons for this. First, the company's chief financial officer may be paying m closer attention to the corporate-level internal controls with the idea that <clears throat> the corporate-level internal controls are the final filter to detect issues. This follows partly from the focus most com companies have on controls over financial reporting, which does not include all controls needed for compliance. A second reason is that many companies were built through acquisitions, resulting in many business units, both inside and outside the U.S., having completely different accounting system and internal control systems than in the corporate office. There is often a tendency to, to leave acquired companies in the state in which they were acquired, rather than integrate their controls and conform those to the current business units. After all, the reason for the acquisition was the profitability of the acquired company, and nobody wants to be accused of negatively impacting profitability. A third situation may exist at locations outside the U.S. that simply began as a sales office. Then the location gradually expanded its scope of operations to become a more full-scoped business unit with its own accounting and data processing functions. Unfortunately, it is not often the situation in which there was a master plan for internal controls as the location scope grew. Often processes were added internally and were usually designated by local personnel that in practice meant the country manager had total control over the financial affairs and was not really accountable to the corporate office. There, this can be particularly true as long as the country's business unit's profits continue. In these situations, there will rarely be a focus on preventative internal controls for compliance risk. The next area for inquiry is where should a CCO begin in any of the above scenarios? The initial step is to determine the extent of centralization or decentralization of the relevant processes, or to put it in another way, what is to the extent of the relevant processes performed in the corporate offices? In some companies, it is common, for example, to have all vendor invoices paid from the corporate office. In other companies, the corporate accounting function only aggregates the information received from business accounting units. This translates into a varying analysis of risk regarding locations outside the United States, depending on the agree, degree of accounting decentralization. A good starting point is to determine the extent to which financial statements of business units outside the U.S. are reviewed and analyzed by the corporate accounting functions. This will provide good insight into whether corporate accounting function provides an element of internal control or merely s serves as a data aggregator. The first step for a chief compliance officer is to determine the possible universe of risks and assess the risks to result in a priority of how attention will be focused. One useful approach is to perform a location risk assessment where the purpose is to capture one place in one place in one place each location outside the U.S. where your company conducts business and to, to assess the compliance risk posed by the nature of the operations at each location. Once the risk at each location have been properly categorized, then you can prioritize your approach to dealing with those risks. Obviously, this speaks to the need of risk assessment, which is uh, hallmark number four in the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program. It's also uh, more greatly specified in the evaluation of corporate compliance documents released by the Department of Justice in February. 
So the risk assessment can perform a variety of tasks, but the location risk assessment allows you to specifically focus on internal controls at a location outside of the U.S., and there can therefore be a very powerful tool. So what are today's three key takeaways? Well, number one, while this mouse might sound counterintuitive, I've really come around to believe that modifying your internal controls can work more fully to operationalize your compliance program. So the example I gave that you may have to have different controls in a high-risk country or in a geographic location outside of the United States may actually uh, provide greater operationalization and more effectiveness around your compliance program. Number two, check the effectiveness of your internal controls for internal international locations. This is particularly true uh, when you engage in an acquisition because, as I noted, one of the reasons you acquire a company is its inherent profitability or the product or services it has, and you may not want to uh, really uh, try to disrupt that, yet uh, you will need to check the internal control protocol. And finally... Revisit your internal controls when a country or region experiences large growth or other disruption. I often point to the example of Eli Lilly, uh, who got into uh, bribery uh, hot water for, with the SEC in Poland. Well, one of the indicia of that something was a scans was that through bribery of one head of a provincial health service in the province of Silesia, it led to an explosion of growth of Eli Lilly's products and services in the country of Poland. And not only did Silesia become the highest grossing province for the country, the country became the third highest grossing province, excuse me, country in their uh, European uh, country um, geographic region. So when you have a high growth like that, it may mean your internal controls have lagged behind. I hope you've enjoyed day four of one month to better internal controls, and I hope you'll join me tomorrow for day five. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of One Month to Better Internal Controls. If you've listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate this podcast as it would help in our rankings. Get the word out about the only one-month podcast series which enables you to design, implement, and enhance a better compliance program. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you'll join us again tomorrow. This production is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you'll join me again tomorrow.